anytime you're ready. Here's a map of the greater nickel plate system and the part in orange is part of the St. Louis line. Here's St. Louis that I've modeled. It's the third sub from Toledo. It's first sub, second sub, third and fourth. And if I said first, I meant third. Um, this is the part I modeled and the town of Frankfurt is obviously a hub and it's where trains from Peoria, trains from St. Louis come together. And then from there they go over the main line up to Bellevue, Cleveland, Buffalo, New York. Um, or they can go up what became an old branch line, the old Cloverleaf up to uh, Toledo. And there was also a couple of north-south lines. And there was the main line from Chicago all the way up to Buffalo. So these are three different places, Chicago, Peoria, St. Louis flowing together and they're consolidated Frankfurt and then they come together and they're consolidated Bellevue and then they shoot them on east like uh, streetcars. The uh, pile of junk that you're seeing here is uh, scenery. I'm finally getting some scenery done and uh, what we're doing is electrostatic uh, grass work. Uh, it's over here in fact there's a scene here at Linden that shows uh, some of the early applications, electrostatic grass, we're learning as we go. Um, turns out the smart money is on putting down uh, a color of green or brown or whatever and then putting a thick coat of white glue down. And white glue seems to be better than matte medium or anything else because uh, it never sets. It gets hard, but if you respray it with water it gets fluid again. And so once you put down a coating of electrostatic grass, I use the, the uh, HECI applicator that's got a charged screen on the bottom, and you just fill it with the grass and you move it very, very close and very slowly along a wet area. It's got to be wet. You've got to have a probe the other end of this. This is one side of the circuit. The other side would be like a nail stuck where it's wet, so that's the complete circuit. And that creates a, a potential here and you suck it out and, and it'll come out pretty vertically. Uh, once it's dry, you go back with no grass in it and you go over the same areas and you suck any loose grass back up in here and you save it. So this becomes a vacuum. Then you spray it with water and it reactivates the white glue and you go back over it again with nothing more in the container and that tends to pull it vertical. That's the next step here is pulling it back vertical. So we're learning. Uh, but everything's a big mess. Uh, you can see some super trees that are used as uh, small trees going off into the distance with the photo backdrop, the backdrops from uh, Scenic King in Canada. And I'll have that applied all the way around the railroad. I found that it's best to cut the sky off. It's hard to blend skies. I haven't even tried yet. But it's a lot smarter to just go right along the horizon with an X-Acto knife and let whatever blue sky you have behind it show. Again, live and learn. Going back here to Frankfurt, uh, if you can see it under all the stuff, there's really an eastbound yard. The main line is, is here, um, and everything behind the main line towards the wall is the westbound yard, and that's westbound, east to the right. And this is, under all the junk, is the eastbound yard. And eastbound yard goes out of Frankfurt towards Bellevue, uh, Toledo, wherever it's going east of here, Cleveland, Buffalo, um, and that really just goes around the corner and goes into a hidden staging yard. If you go west out of here on the westbound yard, that's the part of the railroad that I've actually modeled. And uh, again, my apologies uh, that uh, during your visit here everything's under construction, but I'm happy to report that I am getting some construction done. Um, this area right here is WY Tower, WY for West Yard, and this is where the main line splits to go to Peoria, to the northwest, or the part I've actually modeled going to the southwest, and that's going to St. Louis on the St. Louis Division. So once you go by WY Tower, you make a choice and you take off for Peoria, which just goes around and into staging, or you actually get into the main part of the railroad, the third subdivision going to St. Louis. So we're now walking westbound, and the first town we come into is the town of uh, Linden, Indiana, 
And as you can see by this uh, Monon BL2 and the depot that is a scratch built model by Frank Odino, the actual depot that uh, is at Linden, it's a museum now. Um, this is where the Monon interchanged with the nickel plate. This is the Monon's line between uh, Chicago and Louisville. And uh, the interchange is these tracks here that go through a hole in the wall. The reason they go through a hole in the wall uh, to get to the other side of a stud wall is that that track is 30 some cars long. And the Monon interchanged with a nickel plate some 12,000 loads a year. That's like 60 loads a day or something. So you need 30 cars in and you need 30 cars out every single day. And that's what those two tracks let us do. And this Monon VL2 would actually be sitting at the end of some 30 cars. And the first cars to be delivered to the nickel plate would be sitting here covering a photo cell. When the nickel plate train comes in and picks up those cars, it only gets the first five or six cars because there's a pin in the KD knuckle that holds the knuckle open. And he just pulls the six cars out, puts them on his train, removes the pin, and takes off. That uncovers the photo cell. And that turns on that BL2 and it starts shoving. And five or ten minutes later, it's creeped forward and shoved another set of cars into view, which cover the photo cell and shut itself off. Another nickel plate train comes into town, makes another pickup, uncovers photo cell, mowing on, shoves forward. And this goes on five or six times a day. You can see down here at the other end of Linden some of the experiments that uh, we were running for uh, uh, photo backdrops. If you get the camera right down and look right down the road, you can see that the photo backdrop blends in pretty well with the modeled road. Uh, there's a fillet between the end of the modeled road and the vertical backdrop. Right now the paint colors don't match, so it's a little more obvious than it should be. But uh, that was just a test to see how it works, and it seems to be working pretty well. This is a big turnback curve at the end of the main peninsula. Inside this area is where the dispatcher's office is. We're coming into the town of Vetersburg, Indiana. And Vetersburg is uh, beginning to get some scenery into it, including a, a double uh, wood trestle that was at the end of, east end of town. And again, you can see the uh, Scenic King backdrop, photo backdrops here. I had enough brains to cut it off at the tree line before I glued it up. And where you get an imperfection in the seam, which you do once in a while, I tried touching it up with chalks or something. It didn't work real well. Um, I'll just put a tree in front of it. You'll never see it. No big deal. Let's check out this dispatcher hole here. Let me uh, turn the light on in there for, for you. There's the dispatcher's office. Uh, we use actual train sheets that were from the nickel plate. We, I got them from eBay and from friends. One of these days I'll run out and have to reprint them. The one that's framed in the backdrop is a uh, Kinko's uh, color copy. It's about 60, 70 bucks to make that big a copy. But it shows a real train sheet from this division. Uh, dates to 1968. No, that's timetable. I think it dates to the late 40s. And uh, 54. Oh, it's even the right year, December 54. And so this lets the dispatcher see exactly what the nickel plate counterpart did. Uh, on on that one trick and so it's a uh, kind of a nice benchmark to have that's a cozy little office here who gets stuck in here uh when well, you're regular operators <laughs> there actually are three guys that compete for this and and they really want the job it's one of their favorite jobs so um, uh, there's no problem getting dispatchers and operators at all uh that's a uh coveted job and and uh, actually probably the first to get filled for every session well you're a, an over six foot guy <laughs> you got you got to crawl in to get in there but once you're in we'll throw in food and drink and you're all set <laughs> you can see the uh get a better idea of what the scenery backdrop kits look like i've taped uh a kit to the wall and, and they're just legal size sheets of paper and you trim them uh, to get rid of the extra end, there's a slight overlap. And if you want to try to save the sky and blend it in, go for it. 
uh, I will simply cut out around here and you don't have to do that perfectly as long as you cut down into the green you'll never notice that uh, you didn't follow the exact tree line and uh, there's a whole catalog of these things in various scales in fact the cover of the current catalog has that scene that I just showed you a few minutes mm -hmm. ago so uh, Sini King in Canada, a guy named Les Maver, doing some nice stuff. In fact, uh, it'd be real hard to see, but he's doing a whole new series of cornfields and wheat fields, and they all blend together. This is the town of downtown Petersburg. It's a stand in depot. Um, I just use the Woodland Scenics uh, depot uh, painted nickel plate colors as a stand in. It's pretty close to some nickel plate depots, and until I got time to scratch build depots, it's going to have to suffice. This is where the Peoria and Eastern cross the nickel plate, but un unlike the Monon interchange, there was only, oh, I don't know, maybe 100 cars a year or something instead of 12,000. So this little stub track here that allows enough for one or two interchange cars, although I guess you could have quite a few interchange cars going along there, um, that's more than enough to, to get us by. Just a wall there stand in for the depot for now. A lot of stand-ins. You know, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. No uh, no point. Because uh, you have to scratch build practically everything you're modeling since you're yeah, doing prototype. When it's prototype, you do. And so uh, if it even looks anything like the prototype, in other words, it's a brick building, that's close enough. Um, I can, until I get it running, there's no sense spending a lot of time on things because you may find that, that there's a problem you have to fix. And if you spend a lot of time on something, and then head tear it out and fix it, that would be a sad day. So I tend to get everything running first. Mm -hmm. This is uh, one of the few areas where the track is not operational, yet I still have to put the points into the uh, turnout here. One of the, uh, and same thing here, these are the uh, Central Valley tie strips. And then I cement with CA uh, Details West frogs they fit right into the Central Valley tie strip. These would be number eights and you can snip one of the webs uh, of the uh, tie strip and actually curve them and then all you got to do is lay you know stock this is code 70 rail you could also put 83 down and uh, I don't glue it I put regular spikes the ties are hollow and uh, microengineering or micromark spikes go right through there. They're a little difficult, but you can do it. And then I file my own points and drop them in, although I think Details West does make uh, points if you need them. Did you um, see where there's a company called Fast Tracks? Fast Tracks is a real good uh, company. Uh, a friend of mine, Ted uh, Pamperin, lives in the next town over. He had never hand laid any track in his life, and he built his entire c &O Railroad using Fast Track jigs. And uh, it runs really well, so those work. The reason I didn't use them is that I wanted the tie plate detail. That's why I didn't handle a track. So I used microengineering flex track code 70 and 55 and it's got all the tie plates and the spikes. Well the only way to get that in the turnouts is to use a Central Valley tie strip or a commercial turnout. And most of the commercial turnouts didn't do what I wanted them to do. So I just bought the Central Valley and details of West parts and build them myself. Now I did handle some turnouts. I'll show you those in a second. But uh, at any rate, uh, you now come to the steepest grade on the railroad. Zoom. This is where a, uh, a lift out bridge goes. Um, the bridge itself will just simply sit down, drop in. There's a, a screw on the bottom that holds it. Uh, you can see it's just a, an aluminum channel. You can see the end of the channel here. And this is a channel that you'd get like at Home Depot that fits around the end of three quarter inch plywood. It's like to dress up plywood. And it's almost exactly the right size for the interior of a bridge. So uh, I then fit either Central Valley or Microengineering uh, deck girder bridges uh, spans over that. And then the towers using uh, uh, Central or Microengineering. Uh, bridge parts, the towers will just fit underneath there, but they're not structurally needed for anything at all. The, uh, you know how it is, the railroad becomes the world's longest shelf to mm -hmm. store things. Um, this is a scene that's going to be one of the next projects that I work on, which means i got to get all my stuff out of there. 
But this is the Wabash River crossing. And it's a good example of uh, the difference between prototype modeling and fine scale modeling. These bridges uh, are very close to what the nickel plate had. And they had a Warren truss bridge, there were four spans and then a wood trestle. And there was a short deck girder span at the east end. Um, so I've modeled all four spans and it's going to be a nice scene. It's about eight feet long. Each bridge is one panel too short. This is the wall there, single track truss with just minor portal changes. Um, if I had converted that or scratch built it to get the right number of panels, I would have had only headroom only for three bridges. So what's more obvious, a missing panel on each bridge or a whole missing span? I think a missing span. So now you can see the photo backdrop. That is a picture I took in the 1970s when that highway bridge was still there and the slide I took only had one of the four highway spans on it so the slide was just this area here and using Photoshop I could clone that three more times mm -hmm. and then get in and change the trees, clone the water uh, the nickel plate bridge that I modeled actually showed up in the sky, I cloned that out it's, that was about the first thing I ever did using Photoshop Elements. It's a pretty easy software to learn when you do it as basically as I did. If you want to do all the bells and whistles, it's pretty hard, but not, not there. Here we're coming into my old hometown of Cayuga, Indiana. There was a water tower here, and fortunately it's at the midpoint of the railroad, so it's a good place for the crews to take water. And then you come into downtown, and and Cayuga did not have all these curves, it was pretty straight, but uh, in the model railroad you got to do what you got to do. You can see a couple of freight trains are meeting here in Cayuga. This is the way it happened to be when we shut the clock off and the power off uh, during the last operating session. So we just leave trains where they were and... Pick up and, where you left off. Yeah, and it'll probably be a different crew, but everything's right here. Their orders, their waybills, everything, the throttle, everything's ready to go. And uh, this is where I was, uh, uh, lived when I was a kid in uh, grade school. And in fact, uh, the Hutchins Cafe here, I worked after school as a uh, soda jerk with the emphasis on jerk. <laughs> and uh, so it'll be fun to model the hometown. My dad ran the brickyard here in town, that's why we lived here. And at Cuyuga, the Chicago and Eastern Illinois double track main line to Evansville crossed. And I've got to uh, build a couple of diamonds and scratch build the tower. That's another wall they're standing. But you can see when I get the CNEI main laid in, it actually goes around out of sight. And that will be staged where a CNEI train at some point will pull up to the home signal and stop and sit there idling. Thank goodness for sound decoders. Mm -hmm. But a CNEI BL2 will come into town and work the interchange. So it'll be uh, a job for somebody. And then... Uh, this curve is legitimate. This is a curve that went up around a gravel pit and then up to my dad's brickyard. And uh, unfortunately, I just have room to model a hint of the, the brickyard, but at least I got a start. And then upgrade from there was an overpass and then a uh, uh, famous to locals uh, nickel plate viaduct. I had uh, heard about it when I was a kid, but I never had a chance to see it until. Um, in the late 1960s, uh, my dad and my son David, who's the little guy in the picture there, he's now in his 40s, um, we went out there and we found this bridge. So you can imagine this picture I took mm -hmm. uh, is very meaningful to me, so I've modeled it. Now, we have two boys and two girls, so I cheated and added <laughs> a girl to the picture um, for uh, political correctness, but, uh, you know, you can't... You can't play favorites. <laughs> this is a uh, S curved up the hill. These curves were introduced on this line coming down the steep hill to the Wabash Valley when this line was narrow gauge. And uh, it was, uh, the curves made the train slow down by friction. And it was, so they were deliberately put in there back in the days before air brakes. Then it was standard gauge in the 1890s, and the nickel plate took it over in 1922-23. And then it was a pain, because by now, the problem is not going downhill. you got air brakes. 
but going uphill behind a Berkshire or Mikado steam engine. And they actually used to use pushers back in the days of 280s. But uh, with the Berks, they usually made it up the hill, but not always. Sometimes they'd get up here to the next town of Humerick, and they'd have to leave half the train up there and come back and get the other half. I actually saw them double the hill, and the summit uh, on the model is all the way up here. And it's a climb. Uh, the guys are working pretty hard. The engines are making a racket as we go. When they, um, instead of doubling the train, wouldn't they have helpers anywhere? No, they didn't use helpers uh, after probably the 20s or so. I don't know exactly when they ended, but I think it was teens or 20s when they had a helper stationed at Cuga. In the nickel plate era, I don't think they ever used pushers. Uh, there wasn't anybody in town. Now maybe if the mic, a mic on the local happened to be in town at the time that they came through and they needed help, maybe, but I never saw that happen. And I lived there from... 51 through the end of steam in 50, 1955, the summer, and uh, then I lived there all the way up through 58, and I never ever saw a pusher, and I think I would have probably heard about that. Um, this is where they crossed the Milwaukee Road, and uh, a little place called Humerick, the Milwaukee, pronounced it Humerick. Uh, it looks like Humerick, but it was Humerick to the locals, and uh, there's a piece of blue masonite hardboard back there. There's a track behind that, and that'll all be covered with trees, so you won't see it, but that'll have that Milwaukee Road Sea Liner, which is what they ran here. And I don't, yeah, that's probably the right paint scheme for that era. Uh, they'll be shoving that on out, just like we talked about at Linden. Mm -hmm. And so the nickel plate will actually interchange uh, and pick up from the humor, uh, interchange track with the Milwaukee all the way down here. Here's the switch out onto the main line and the nickel plate will deliver on this Ford round track. So uh, it's a small town, hardly anybody lives there, but here's 12,000 loads in interchange a year at this place. Amazing. So we're now above Frankfurt where we started and we're simply heading off. We crossed the uh, state line as we came into Humerick, so we're now in the state of Illinois, and we're up here where I'm in a ballasting project right now. Um, you might be able to see up here that uh, I've just filled in. I've used a half inch of home a bed, a quarter inch bottom layer and a quarter inch top layer for the main. The siding, instead of a quarter inch top layer, only gets an eighth inch. That puts the siding that foot lower, eighth inch lower, uh, because sidings weren't ballasted. But now you got to fill that in, and I'm using some coarse um, cinder fill that I'd picked up over the years. It just isn't good enough for what I want to do. But Paul Scholes, who's a very famous uh, scenery guru from the Seattle uh, area, Paul uh, gave a wonderful clinic in Birmingham, uh, Alabama, a couple of weeks ago. He uses decomposed granite not only to do this kind of filling, but to create landforms. In other words, all the flowing land would be decomposed granite. And of course, everybody in Birmingham says, great, where are we going to get decomposed granite in Birmingham? It turns out if you go into Home Depot and you buy a bag of paver sand, that stuff that you use to set to paver stones and mm -hmm. bricks, that's decomposed granite. And it's not expensive. So I need to go buy some of that stuff. And I'll use that as all the filler and I'll use it to shape the landforms instead of plaster and, and it's the right color and everything. If you've got a stream bed you just scrape it out with your fingers and uh, you're done. So really a great tip that to Paul passed along to us there. So I can't wait now to get, get more done up here. We're coming into, uh, you know, once again a lot of construction zone here, mm -hmm. but we're coming into the town of Metcalf, Illinois and uh, Metcalf uh, had a V-shaped depot. I've just got a couple of plastic depot stand-ins, but they had a great big concrete elevator. It's still there. Um, today, it's the CSX instead of the old Baltimore, Ohio, that crosses instead of the nickel plate. It's the Eastern Illinois Railroad, a short line. This part of the old nickel plate is still intact and still running, but east of here, uh, it's all abandoned. But west of here, all the way down into the next division point of Charleston, the tracks are all still in. So this is a Kitbash Walders uh, kit uh, that's very similar to the, the building that was there at the time. 
If you go there today, it's painted bright yellow, but I just didn't see yellow. It's probably correct for the 50s. But uh, that uh, B&O interchange there will actually work. I just got back uh, one of my B&O Jeeps with decoder and sound and stuff in it. So we'll actually have a B&O guy come out. He'll work the interchange and then he'll back up to clear the home signal and wait for the home signal to change. Well, it won't change. That's a trick I learned from Bill Darnaby. <laughs> we're completely on the upper deck now and we're coming. We're still in the, uh, in the state of Illinois. We're still heading west towards uh, the next division point of Charleston. And we're coming in now into the town of Oakland, Illinois. And uh, there was a passing track here, another interchange with a Pensy branch, and uh, oh, a couple of grain elevators, oil dealer. In other words, your typical Midwestern town. Uh, you got to have a grain elevator. And here I just uh, put flats up on the wall because there wasn't enough depth. Uh, most of the railroad that you've seen is 16 inches wide, and that's more than deep enough to get things going. Stand-in depot for the Pensy right now, but if you paint it Pensy colors, it put a Pensy sign on it, it kind of looks Pensy. And once again, we're at the gap into the area where the garage door uh, goes. There'll be another bridge across there. And then this is the Ombra River. It's spelled Embarrass, but it's pronounced Ombra. And the way this bridge will actually be built is it will be a deck truss bridge. So this will sit up even with this. And it's a pin connected bridge, so I probably won't be able to use the Central Valley Bridge the way it is. I'll probably have to build a new one with a bunch of pin connected uh, bars there. Now we come into the little town of Fair Grange, Illinois. And at one time it had a depot, of course, but today if you go there, there's a big elevator and all that. And I've modeled it as best I could uh, with the data that I had. And we're now coming into the outskirts of Charleston, Illinois. And Charleston's the other division point yard. And you can see that that even for me, I'm 6'3", um, this is almost perfect rail fan height. But it's not ideal to work. So road crews would grab a hold of one of these uh, railing or handles and just pull themselves up on a platform. And then if they stand up there and climb up there, Scott, you see you get a pretty good view uh, of what's going on in Charleston. And then the yardmaster and the hostler would work in this alcove, which has got a raised floor. Now you can see much better to work, and if I need to, I can step up on another step and work in here and then step down. And I thought I was going to say you have to be this high to work in Charleston, but wouldn't you know it, the shorter guys in my crew are the guys who always want to work up here. But they can just stand on this step and they can work the way all the way along it because there's a railing just like, you know, a hand for the ship and a hand for yourself. So they can work up here the whole time. Somebody that's a little taller can stand down here and work. So they've got their own alcove, the engine servicing facility, Ron House will be back there, turntable is back there. So it's a pretty nice little alcove, and road crews stay out where you're filming from. Now if you come down to this end, you can see um, a little bit more of the engine terminal. That's an accurate model of the old uh, old old steel coal dock. And then hop up there, there's another platform where uh, crews coming into the yard from this end, you can stand up there and get a better view. Uh, there's going to be cattle pens and an oil dealer back there. And then you can see downtown Charleston where across the Big Four, New York Central. And then uh, the Charleston Depot. Uh, that's very, that's the Walder's uh, Pella Depot, but it's very similar to what was actually there. And then it goes on into staging and you can walk over there and get a good look in the staging yard. And that's West End Staging. That represents everything west of Charleston on the 4th subdivision all the way down to St. Louis. So that's a tour of the railroad and uh, hopefully you could see a little bit of it among the uh, amidst all the carnage and Well, you've, and, you've, and you've stuff, come, but, come uh, a long way, Tony, since the alley game Midland days. <laughs> well, that I, was kind of hard to take down the Midland when it was so finished, you know, you could say claim uh, victory, but uh, 
that's not the point. The point's to have fun, so I'm having fun. So. Well, not too many people can say they can build one finished railroad and then go on and build a second and try and finish <laughs> it in a lifetime. Well, maybe I'll do a third one, you know. I keep swearing I'm going to do old scale or something, so we'll see. There may be an era change, too. Uh, I've acquired a lot of second generation power, and it, it gradually dawned on me that... Uh, my nickel plate, in quotes, was this part of the nickel plate, but it was also the 1960s. That's when I was an active rail fan with a good 35mm SLR. The 50s, I was a little kid, and I saw steam, and I love steam, and uh, I lived in this town. The 60s, I lived, for the most part, up in northern Indiana, in Michigan City. But uh, then we went to Purdue. And uh, so most of the time on a Sunday afternoon, I'd take off over to Frankfurt. I got to know Don Daly and, and uh, some of the people, dispatchers, and uh, a guy named Daryl McKinney and his son Mike. And uh, so the memories I have of the 60s are GP30s, uh, GP35, a Century 420, they just had one of each, a um, bunch of RS11s, RS36s, uh, that kind of thing. So. Uh, when Atlas announced they were coming out with a nickel plate RS-36, I ordered a bunch of them right away. And we'll see. You lose the passenger trains if you right. go past 59. And steam is still pretty neat, uh, particularly with sound decoders. But so is diesel. So we'll see. Well, thanks for the tour. Yeah.